Good morning. I'm glad to have everybody here this morning. Is my volume okay? Can, can everybody across the street hear me as well? Um, do what? We can make it that way. I'm sure we can. Uh, before we get started with our Bible lesson this morning, are there anybody that need prayer requests? Uh, I know I've got one that I want to put out there, but I want to put it out to anybody else. If there's anybody that we know um, that needs to be added to our prayer list that may not be on it yet. We definitely want to keep him in our prayers then. Um, that's a tough diagnosis. Is there any? Yes, sir, Carl. Kidney problems are never a lot of fun to deal with, that's for sure. And we know we've got a lot in our bulletin as well. Is there anyone that I missed? Uh, my mom, as most of you know, had breast cancer um, and breast surgery a couple weeks ago. I said about five weeks ago, I guess. And they thought they'd got it all, that it hadn't gotten into the lymph nodes. Unfortunately, the type of cancer it is, it came back as a very, very aggressive type. So while she didn't think she was going to have to go on chemotherapy, she was going to have to go on it for about a year. Uh, the last time she had to take it, it didn't treat her very well at all. So uh, please keep her in her prayers because uh, she's, uh, she sounded like she was okay with it yesterday, but I know deep down it was a pretty heavy blow to her. So I would really appreciate that. So if you don't mind, we're going to have a word of prayer before we begin our lesson. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you as your servants and family this morning to give thanks for the many blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to gather here with like-minded Christians to edify one another, to strengthen one another, to lean on one another. We thank you, Father, for your son that made that ultimate sacrifice to be separated from you physically at birth, to be separated from you spiritually on the cross and take all of our sins upon himself. We pray, Father, that as we go through our lives, we will remember that sacrifice. But especially, Father, lift up this morning those that we've mentioned here that are sick and others that we know that uh, may not have been mentioned specifically here this morning. We pray that you will be with them as they go through these trying times, that their spirit will remain strong, that they will continue to lean upon you. We pray that you'll be with their families, that they will be able to see their needs without being um, required or asked, that they will go above and beyond to help them bear their burdens as they go through these times. We pray that you'll be with their doctors, that they will use their knowledge and the, the best of their ability to help them to recover as quickly as possible by um, assigning the right treatments and being able to follow up with them. Father, we humbly come and ask all these things that you will help us to be the type of Christian that we can be, the kind of brother and sister that we should be to our Christian family, to lift one another up, to see when someone is hurting, to be able to help them. We pray, Father, that you'll be with the missionaries throughout the world and for all the others that are struggling to follow your word with the temptations that come. All these things we ask in your son's most holy name. Amen. So this morning, if you've got your books, uh, got your Bibles, we're going to be studying from the book of 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy is one of my favorite books. Uh, it's uh, a couple years ago. I guess about four years ago, I started a series in Tennessee where we went through every book in the Bible during our uh, Bible study. We started in uh, Matthew, went through all the New Testament books kind of in detail, and we started back in Genesis and went through them all. Uh, if you've never done a complete study of the Bible, it's a very um, interesting one. Uh, I will say there are some books that are a lot tougher to get through than others. Uh, the book of Numbers, I will say, is probably not my favorite to study in detail because even though I like numbers, having an entire book filled with numbers was uh, slightly challenging to get through. But 2 Timothy to me is uh, one of those that we can apply factually very easily. It's one of those that uh, can make a big difference in our lives when we look at the attitudes. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's the second recorded letter that we have of Paul to Timothy. Paul was an older man at the time, a preacher who had been a strong servant of God for a long time. Timothy was a young man. And we don't really know his age, but we do know that Paul looked at him as a young man. So he could have been 16, he could have been 30. You know, it all depends on what you define as a young man. The older I get, the old, younger I feel. So 45, which is what I turn this year, will be uh, young for me still, at least after I get up and move around and get all the stiffness out of the way. Um, so we don't really know Timothy's age, but we do know he was considered to be a young man. He was raised in 
by his mom and his grandmother in the, in the faith, so he had been in it a long time, and um, we're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 2, because I think that's uh, kind of a, a great study, a great place to go. It starts out, it says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You know, it starts out there with my child. You know, we talk about being the family of God a lot. We talk about being the children of God, being the sons and daughters of God. Yet, when we look around, do we really treat ourselves like family? Sometimes we do. I mean, I know sometimes it's easy. Uh, I know Michael Grooms probably feels like he's got a big family after the large group of people showed up to help him get moved in, get everything settled in. But family is really who we are. I mean, at our fundamental part of being a Christian that's where it starts, being family. So we'll throw it out there now. What are some of the things that you think we do well as Christians to treat others as family? I think that's one of the things we do well is that we do help others. Could we do a better job at it? Yeah, I mean, I think we all can because benevolence is a very tough position to be in, both in the asking part for help and in the giving part for help. Yes, sir. You were there, but I heard you did a great job directing. That's what, you know, you were overseeing. And it's true. I mean, our actions speak louder than our words. People watch us and they see us. Uh, we were watching a motivational speaker Friday morning at the convention we were at. And he, you know, he used a phrase that I've heard many times and just hearing it again kind of brought it back to life. People don't know how much, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, evangelism starts with benevolence. It starts with us being willing to help others internally because we're not willing to help people inside the church that need help. People wonder, well, if you call yourselves family and your family's in need and you're not there for you, it doesn't look very highly on, I want to become part of that family. Um, so I think that's an important thing that we do. The second part here that he says, he says, you know, you're going to be strengthened by the grace. Where does our strength come from? Do we have our own internal strength? No. Where does our strength come from as Christians? It comes from God, right? I mean, when we look at the Beatitudes, it talks about being emptied. Spirit, poor in spirit, right? But what he doesn't say there, or what he doesn't spell out explicitly, I guess, is that when he talks about being poor in spirit, it means we don't, we're not full of ourselves. We don't depend on ourselves. We don't say, I can, but through God, I can. That God's spirit fills me and allows me to be able to do those things. And that's the kind of spirit and attitude that we have as Christians toward each other, is being filled with God's spirit. Second part there, that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust the faithful men who will also be able to teach others. You know, we often talk about teaching, going out and having Bible studies, but notice what Paul's emphasis there is. It's not just on finding others to teach, but finding others to teach who can also go out and teach. Because while I like to talk, and I could probably teach as much as anybody, there's a limited number of people that I'm eventually going to be able to impact, right? But if I go out, and I find others, and I teach them to teach, the effect that I have gets multiplied exponentially. And it's the same thing we have as Christians when we do Bible studies, or when we do benevolence, when we bring somebody in. You never know that person who comes in for a visit one time, maybe he doesn't become a teacher or a preacher, but maybe his son does, or his grandson does, because of the impact that you have. Um, it's one of those things that we have to realize everything we do, everything we say as Christians, affects the world around us. It affects whether or not people want to come. Because if we have a bad attitude in life, how likely are people to go, you know, I want what that guy's got. If I'm walking around all the time going, man, life's terrible, but it's terrible, 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 terrible. Yeah, I want to be part of that group. That's exciting. You know, whether, you, you know, whether you're in a multi-level marketing group or not, one of the things they do teach is attitude matters. Because if you're not nice, if people don't, in marketing, we call it no like, and trust. If people don't know you, like you, and trust you, they're not going to follow anything you want. And we all do that, right? 
we have somebody that we know, we have somebody that we like, and they make a recommendation for a restaurant, are we likely to believe them and take them up on it? Yes. We have somebody we don't know, or we don't like, and they go, man, it's a great place, you gotta go. Yeah, I think I'll avoid it just because you want me to go there. It's the same thing with Christianity. If our friends and people that see us at work, the places where we're out, look at them and go, that man's got a lousy attitude all the time. I don't want whatever he's got. It's gotta be like an infection. Oh, he's going to that church? Probably don't want to go there. Our attitude matters, and it's one of those things that we can choose um, greatly. Um, so then going down to verse 3, he says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuit, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. How many of you have served in the military? I haven't. I'm just putting my hand up. Okay, so we've got a couple. We've got a few. Um, Military service to me has always been one of those fascinating things when you study the way they bring people into the military, when they indoctrinate them, when they teach them. Talking to the people that are ex-military, if you talk to somebody that's a Marine, they're not ex-Marines, they're still Marines, they're just not actively serving. You know, they've been brought into it in such a way that their focus, their identity is wrapped around that. Do we do that as Christians? You know, do we bring ourselves in when we become a new Christian? And this is one thing that I've, I've taught about a couple times and, and studied with a lot. We do a great job, I think, sometimes in evangelizing up to baptism. We work hard with them. We focus on them. We Bible study. We bring special events to them. We get them up out of the water and go, whew, you're done. And we see a lot of people do this, fall away after because they don't get that. You know, if you look at the military, when they bring you out of basic, they send you on to advanced training. They're constantly reinforcing that, building you and growing you. And that's something that I think as a church, we've got to work on improving is how do we get people that are in the basics? Yes, sir. The Navy SEALs have a motto, no man left behind, and even a dead soldier, a dead SEAL, they're going to do everything in the world to make sure his body doesn't get left there. You know, they are willing to risk their life to make sure that happens. And when you see that kind of dedication, when you see that kind of focus, it makes us realize that when we think of ourselves as soldiers, because we are, we're in a battle, right? I mean, the Bible even says that we're in a war with the principalities of evil, and the ultimate result is we either go to heaven or we go to hell. That's a pretty big consequence. You know, I've got some friends that are in the military and they've never seen combat. Never had a gun shot at them or anywhere close to them. To them, it's kind of a distant thing. I've also had some friends that are on their fourth tour of duty in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places, you know, seeing friends die and everything else. When you talk to them about war, it's a very different thing. You know, they understand the cost and the consequences, but do we as Christians? Do we understand the cost of letting one of our fellow brothers or sisters kind of slide away a little bit? You know, in the military they do. They see a guy not performing. They generally tend to, as a group, get him back up to speed. They don't even have to get the leaders involved because the team is going to make sure my life depends on Scott being able to do what he's supposed to do. I'm going to make sure Scott knows what he's supposed to do and get him right. But do we take that same attitude toward each other as Christians? I know I don't a lot of times. I mean, I, you know, yes, sir, go. How much do you have to know to become baptized? A lot or a little? Not a whole lot, right? I mean, if we look at it truly, you have to know that God is in heaven, that his son came to the earth and died for us, and that you're willing to confess that and be obedient to him. I mean, fundamentally, that's all you need to know. Is that a great depth of knowledge? No. 
I mean, you can do that in an hour from zero if you really want to. Yes, sir. When it talks about baptism, it says we arise as a new creature, right? In other places it says that I came to visit you and you were like a babe still seeking after the sincere milk. You haven't grown to be able to eat the strong meat. You know, as a new Christian, we don't have to know a whole lot. We're a young child. Would any of us take a young six-month-old child and turn him loose? Depends on the child, probably. I mean, let's be honest. Especially if it's not ours. And say, hey, that kid's a little tough. Are you going to make mistakes? When you become a Christian, are you going to be perfect at everything you teach and learn and know? 40 years later as a Christian, are you going to be perfect at everything you teach and learn and know? No. None of us ever get to that point, right? We're all learning. Some of us are just further up the scale than others. Some of us may know just enough to have the passion and the zeal to want to teach others, but not a lot of depth in being able to teach them. So finding somebody to put them with, to say, here, we want you to be involved with this person because he's really good at this, Learn and model yourself after him. You know, Paul even says it in a couple of places. Follow me only as I follow Christ. Because he was the example that he gave. He was the example he's given here to Timothy too. Watch what I do. Watch what I say. And that's something that we have to be, I think, cognizant of and aware of. Is that even as we're older and we've been Christians for a long time and we've been teaching for a long time, we have to be willing to look for others to continue to be stronger. Uh, the meeting we were at uh, this past couple of days was for our our business and there were a couple people in there I got to speak on one panel but one of the guys that was in the audience asking questions his company does significantly better than mine and I felt kind of odd that he's sitting there knowing in my mind he's further along than I am but he's asking me what did you do well what did you learn how do you set things up and I made the comment to the group that was in there that attitude is what makes him successful because he's constantly asking how can I improve how can I get better what, I'm, what is someone else doing better than me? Because while we may be very good at one thing, there's other parts of our lives we have to improve. And as Christians, I think that's what God expects us. You know, in 10 years, we look back at our life and go, you know what, I'm the same kind of Christian today that I was in 2013. God will be very disappointed in us. We should be very disappointed in ourselves. Well, I'll let you go first, James. And I, and I think, I guess when I say we forget them, I think sometimes it's the attitude we take toward them. You know, just the, when we have somebody that we know is coming who's not a member of the church, we tend to spend a lot of time talking to them, introducing ourselves. After they become a Christian, you know, we'll all come give them a hug, welcome them to the family. It just seems like, at least my experience, and not necessarily here, but in other places I've been as well, that that attention tends to fade. You know, we bring them out, they're a new Christian, they're done. You know, they're fully baked, it's like pulling a cake out of the oven, you're ready to put some icing on it, just kind of let it go. Well, they do have a responsibility as their own as a Christian to grow, but we also have a responsibility as a family to help them, to help them. Even James, as old as he is, because we know Methuselah and him are competing right there, needs to improve on things. I know I need to improve on things. I tell people all the time, I used to say it all the time when I preached as well, that I'm getting ready to preach God's word, and my goal is to get the messenger out of the way of the message. And if the message doesn't come through as being biblical, Please come get me now, because I don't want to spend the rest of my life teaching error, because if I do on Judgment Day, guess what happens? Depart from me, for I know you not. Those are some scary words, because I know what comes after that, and I'm not really looking forward to it. So I'd much rather have an uncomfortable conversation now with somebody coming up and going, Scott, I didn't really agree with what you taught there. Okay, well, let's sit down and see what God's Word says, because that's my role and my goal. I don't want my opinion to be. I want God's word to motivate what I do. And that's part of, I think, growing from that being a young Christian. Because as a young person, if we kind of equate them, equate them, a young person wants to do what? Push the limit, come up with their own rules, say, well, I'll agree with you here and I'll be obedient there, but over here I'm not going to be obedient. What that really means is I'm not obedient ever, 
I'm just doing what I want to. Sometimes we line up, sometimes we don't. And if we take that attitude as Christians, where do we end up? In trouble, right? If not, I'm obedient when it's convenient. So I'm obedient when it's inconvenient. Because if it's convenient and I agree with you, it's not really being obedient. We're just walking down the same path. But if I get to a turn and there's a left and a right, and I want to go right, and the Bible says to go left, and I go, well, this one time I'm going to disagree. What that means is, fundamentally, I've never agreed with you. We just happen to be going in the right time. And I think that's a challenge for all of us as we go through life to look at what we believe, what we teach, and make sure, is this exactly what God wants us to do? To constantly challenge ourselves on, is what I'm teaching truly what's in God's word? Truly what God wants us to do? Because we can go above and beyond what's in God's word, and that's not acceptable either, right? You know, Paul even said in a couple of places, my opinion, he says, I wish all, you know, all men could not be married, but that's my opinion. We need to be careful when we teach that I go, this is exactly what God says. My opinion is you probably need to be over here if you want to be safe. But we're clear that this is opinion and this is God's word. Because on judgment day, God's word is all that matters. Because if my opinion ends up being wrong or I teach my opinion as fact, I'm going to be held accountable for that too. Thanks. Yes, sir. My mom's been a Christian for about 60 years, and she said that same thing before, that every time, maybe not every time, but usually once a month when she's reading and studying, she'll see something differently, mainly because her experience has changed and the way we recognize what God wants us to is changing. Because if you think about it, the decisions you make now at whatever age you are is very different than the ones you made when you were 15 or 16 or 17 or 20 years. Hopefully, right? I mean, I have friends that are in their 40s that still make decisions like a 13-year-old, and I kind of worry about them ever making it to 50, but, you know. The other thing about, you know, the comment about it being in the military is, and not being entangled in civilian life, if you're at war and your life is depending on your actions being consistent with the team and the directions and everything else you've got, you can't be sitting there thinking about all the things at home. They may be in your mind, but you've kind of got to put them out. I know when I was taking martial arts and we were doing our sparring practice and I was getting punched in the face, you realize real quickly, it's not the same as war, but it is the same as I'm getting hurt. This is not any fun. Everything else goes out of your mind except how do I stop this from happening? Well, as Christians, when we look at our daily lives, we have to constantly wake up and go, I'm at war this morning with the devil. I'm at war this morning with evil. How can I survive today so that I can help others survive tomorrow? It's a different mindset really when you look at it because when you think about the way the military trains we look at it and go that's insane they're up at 4 a.m they go running for 20 miles with this 80 pound pack on their back they sleep in the dirt that's crazy so you realize that they're doing it so that when somebody's shooting at them and they got to run 20 miles with somebody chasing them because they're outnumbered they can get home and be able to make it do we study our bible the same way that our life depends on our knowledge of it i know i don't so, I mean, when I teach these lessons, I teach them more for me. I had somebody a couple, a couple years ago come up to me and she goes, were you intentionally teaching to me? And I said, no, I was stepping on my own toes. You know, this is usually how I come up with my sermons is, what do I think I'm not doing well? How can I step on my own toes? And if I step on yours by mistake, you know, we're in the same boat together. So just realize that. The second uh, verse right after that, it, it talks about an athlete. It says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules competes according to the rules. How many of you guys know who Tim Ferriss is? He wrote a book called The Four-Hour uh, Work Week and The Four-Hour Body and a couple other things. He was taking a martial art and uh, he went over to Asia and he's the only non-Asian person to ever win a gold medal in this competition. Because he read through the rules and he wasn't that good at the martial art, but he was bigger and stronger than most of the people he competed with. And you could win by disqualifying your opponent by just throwing them out of the ring. Not actually beating them, So he got really good at throwing people out of the ring. 
Now, the people he was beating were very unhappy with it because they're like, that's not fair. You didn't beat me with skill. And he goes, but these are the rules. He won because he knew the rules better than the person he was playing with. You know, if I invited you to say, hey, let's go Saturday and we're going to play a sport. What's the first thing you're going to ask? What sport, right? Because if you're playing football, I'm going to come dressed differently than if we're playing lacrosse or water polo or, you know, golf. But we need to know the rules. Uh, when we were over at uh, Travis's the other night for his birthday party, he started wanting to play spades, and the first question I had was, what rules? Because Travis and them play with a very odd set of rules. So I always like to make sure I know what they are, because they call them house rules. You know, it's our house, our rules, rules, just to be clear. I'm like, we'll play however you want to. I just want to know what the rules are, because your strategy changes, right? Well, if we're going to be crowned as Christians in heaven, what do we need to know? The rules. Where do we find the rules? In the book, in the Bible. Yes, Scott. That's right. They're not subjective. It is do this, don't do this. And if we look at New Testament Christianity, where does it really start? What's Jesus say is the number one rule, so to speak? Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Everything. What's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself, and it says, upon these two rules, so to speak, everything else is built. So what is that? Is love an action, or does it start with an attitude? It starts here, right? Before we ever do anything, we have to have the right attitude toward God. We have to have the right attitude toward our neighbor. You know, I made the comment that if I ever do anything or teach anything wrong, I want you to come to me. Don't come to me with a baseball bat. Come to me with love, because you're going to get a much better reception. Right? If you come to somebody and the first thing you do is start swinging, what do they do? They're going to step back and take your head off if they can. Or they're going to curl up like a ball and just ignore everything you say. But if you come to them with love, with the proper attitude of, I love you and I don't think what you're teaching is correct and I'm concerned about you, can we study it? That's a very different approach than, Jay, you're wrong. Because if I start out with, Jay, you're wrong, I know what Jay's going to do. Wait a minute now. Come on, I ain't wrong. Right? He's going to dig in his heels. We all do because it's human nature. It's the way we're wired. When I was taking martial arts, it's one of the things they do. They teach you that if you push somebody else, the first thing they're going to do is push back. If you want to get them to move, you've got to get them kind of guided that way. Because unless you're a lot stronger than them, it's going to be hard. I know when I was raising my son, when he was little and he was disobedient, I could physically pick him up and go put him in his room and you're staying there because I can make you. When he got up to about 17 and he was about 210 pounds, that was a lot more difficult to be able to make him do something. It became a lot more of a guidance issue. Of I could still make him, it was just a whole lot of work. And most of the time wasn't worth it. So we have to find new ways to know those rules. And one of my favorite verses in 2 Timothy, what time is class in, by the way? 15 after, so I got about 10 more minutes? Okay. One of my favorite verses in 2 Timothy 2 is uh, verse 15. It says, um, I'm reading from the English Standard. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do our best. It's a pretty strong statement, right? But when we raise children, what do we ask them to do? Do your best. I always told my son this when he was growing up. Look, I don't care if you're a C student. If that's the best you can do, be the best C student in class. If you're an A kind of student, be the best A student you can. I didn't really care as long as he was doing his best. God's the same way. He wants us to do our best. Because do we all have the same intelligence? No. Do some people struggle in understanding certain concepts or, or being able to do some things? Because how many of you feel comfortable standing in front of a group and talking like this? Not a lot of people, right? There's a few. I mean, believe it or not, 20 years ago, I would not have been up here speaking. 25, I guess. I used to be scared to death to do public speaking. I mean, it literally made me nauseous and I would go throw up. I had to do it a couple of times at work. Um, I preached my first sermon when I was 15 and my next sermon when I was like 25 because it scared me so much that first time. I had no idea what I talked about. I got up and I sat down and I had sweat pouring off of me and I was like, I'm never doing this again. Who talked me into this? This is crazy. And everybody's coming, oh, you did a great job. And I'm like, oh, never happening again. But along the way, took some classes that helped me improve and expand my abilities, got better, hopefully I got better, I think my sermons are better now than they were 20 years ago, yes sir Scott, 
You're going to tell me my sermons aren't better now? You're going to make me cry. call it the mirror test. There's two mirror tests you got to take every day. One is you get up in the morning, you look yourself in the mirror, and you tell yourself, I'm going to do the best I can today. Two, you look at yourself in the mirror when you get ready to go to bed that day, and you answer that question, did I do the best I could today? I think 99% of us on that second test are going to say no, because I know my days kind of, you know, they disappear on you. You're like, what happened for the last 12 hours? Yes, ma'am. I'm scared sometimes when I call on you. I just want you to know that. A lot of times they don't always proof those pieces because sometimes they say things they're going to get in trouble for. You know, and looking back to where we were, the next verse after the athlete, it says, the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. You know, my dad used to raise a uh, garden. When I said garden, it was a half acre when we were younger. And uh, that's a lot of work. And uh, it took a lot of work to get it ready and to plant it and to keep it ready and then to collect it and then to make it all edible and everything else. And you start realizing that he wasn't the greatest gardener, he wasn't the greatest farmer, but every year he got a little better because he was willing to put the hard work into it. He's 83 years old now and has had two knee replacements, can barely walk without a cane, yet he put out a garden this year. He would ride his riding lawnmower out there with a post hole digger and he would stop and he would dig a hole and he would plant something and he would drive up to the next one and he would plant something. And I watch him doing that and I realize that it's just heart. It's desire to do that that drives him. And do we have that same heart and desire to do good for God? Because I'm not good at some things. I, you know, I struggle seeing when people are in need or when people need a helping hand or when people need a little encouragement. I've got an aunt who does that fantastic. She doesn't do a lot of other things well, but if she knows somebody's sick, they're getting a card and a call from her every time, usually once a week until they get better. I can't remember the last time I called without my mom telling me brother so-and-so sick you need to call him because it's just not i don't know not something i'm comfortable with not something that it just clicks for me we all have to find the things that we are good at in serving the lord and being good at that being the best we can be at that for god's service because everything we do is for god's service whether it's our singing in the pew you know you heard me talk about singing a couple weeks ago I'm not very good, but I love it. People that sit around me probably don't enjoy the fact that I love it as much as I do, but it makes me feel better. When I start singing and glorifying God, it makes me feel uplifted. It gives me energy. It fills me with that love to want to do more, to want to do better. You know, Michael talked last week about you know, improving our evangelism, getting out into the community, because the preacher doesn't grow the congregation. He's only one man. He can only do so much. He's only got 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, just like the rest of us. And while it may be his full-time job, he cannot connect to as many people as every person in this audience can. And our goal as Michael comes in, as we enter this new phase, is to help do that. Because on Judgment Day, do you really want somebody you knew standing beside you going, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you at least give me an opportunity? Why didn't you invite me? Now, you can also get used to disappointment because the majority of people are going to say, nah, I'm not interested. I'm happy where I'm at. But the majority of people told that to Christ as well. The majority of people that Christ taught weren't faithful, weren't obedient. He even said it in one of his sermons, I know the only reason you're here, and this is kind of a paraphrase, is to see what's going to get done and who's going to get fed. You're here for the service. Yes, sir.
See, now, now she's going to duck her head and hide. But you know what? That's the right attitude to have about it, too, because we're not doing it to glorify ourselves. We're not doing it to glorify, look what I've done, but look at how I've helped someone else. That makes us feel good when we do that mirror test at night. May not have done much, but I helped lift somebody up. I helped encourage somebody. I helped someone have a little bit better day. That's a pretty big thing, because a lot of times that little bit is the difference between them having a terrible day and them being able to change their attitude and how they go about it. Those little things matter. Whether it's sending a card, making a call, greeting somebody. Um, I can't tell you how many people that I've had mentioned that are visiting or guests or something that I knew or I've invited here that said, this is the friendliest congregation they've ever been to. And when people come to our congregation in Tennessee, that's always our goal. It's a small one. But I want every person in there to greet every person that comes in. To go make that effort because have you ever been to a congregation where you went in and nobody spoke to you? How excited were you to worship God with those people? Not very, right? When you go to a family reunion, do you ever go in and nobody greets you? No. Usually everybody's coming up to you. Usually they give you a hard time, but at least they come up to you and talk. Every time we meet here, it is a family reunion. We need to take that time and effort to go out and speak to as many people as we can, to encourage one another, to lift one another up, to say, I love you like a brother, like a sister, and I love God, and I want us both on Judgment Day to hear that same message. Well done, a good and faithful servant. I mean, yes, ma'am. How do I volunteer for that job? I don't mind being a judge for a pie and a barbecue contest. Now, is it easy? No. I mean, none of the stuff we're talking about here is easy, because if it was, everybody would be doing it. But getting into heaven isn't easy either. But it's worth it. It's like winning that gold medal we talked to the people that made the sacrifice to get to that point. They all talked about how it was worth it. The effort, the energy that I put into it. When we get to Judgment Day, that's what we can say. Whatever sacrifices we've made, whatever struggles we've had, whatever things we've overcome, it was worth it. All right. That's it for me. I got through 10 verses. That's the most I usually make in a class. I'm impressed by that. <laughs> 